San Jose, in the heart of Silicon Valley. It's theCUBE, covering Big Data SV 2016. Now your hosts, John Furrier and Peter Burris. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live for exclusive coverage of Strata Hadoop here at Big Data SV, our event right across the street from Strata Hadoop. I'm John Furrier, this is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events, and extract the signal from the noise. My co-host Jeff Frick for this segment and our guest Chris Devaney, VP of Operation of a company called Data Robot. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. So talk about Data Robot, because on your site you have a stat, 63 million models or stuff being done, which is a, a, a grabber, certainly on the website at datarobot.com. What do you guys do? Because you, you, that's, a, that's a huge number. Is that the number of customers? What, what do you guys do? Let's go break down what you guys do. That's the number of models that okay. have been built from our customers utilizing our cloud platform. Um, but Data Robot believes that every company on the planet would benefit from doing predictive analytics. The problem is there's a finite number of data scientists to do that. Uh, and that's where Data Robot's changing the world. Uh, we are building a automated machine learning platform. Um, 11 of our data scientists are in the top, are in Kaggle's top 100. We have three former number one data scientists, number one female, number one in the world, all work for Data Robot. So what we've done is we've taken their collective knowledge, um, coupled with world-class engineering, and we built an automated platform. So what would normally take a data scientist weeks or months, the platform can do in hours or minutes and days. So one of the things people talk about, and first of all, machine learning is, is hot, and that is really the under the hood that, uh, value for a lot of things we're seeing with cloud and some of the apps that are out there. And you know, hear about AI, all this stuff that's kind of futuristic, certainly getting the headlines. But there's some real action going on with machine learning and these underlying technologies that's enabling a lot of opportunities. But the issue that we've heard years and years, it's our seventh year doing Hadoop World, now called Strata Hadoop, Big Data Week, whatever you want to call it, is how do you scale data science? Mm -hmm. it's, it's just too hard to become a data scientist. And you know they're coming on board, so the number's going up, sure, but just exponentially, they're not growing. So the question is, how do you scale data science? How do you put data science in the hands of analysts or business people? That's always been the problem. Right. What do you guys do to attack that problem? So through the automation of the platform, as you can imagine, we greatly increase productivity of data scientists. If we can bring their normal tasks from weeks to months down to, to um, you know, minutes and days, but more importantly, I think, is an autopilot feature of the platform itself. So it allows non-data scientists, business analysts, who don't have math, stat, coding skills, but they have great domain knowledge uh, to be able to use this autopilot feature it's kind of data science with guardrails so that they can create models, they can implement the, the model and make predictions with zero coding. So that's really what changes the marketplace for a, for a business analyst doing data science. So are they starting from scratch and answering questions? Are they starting with a model and doing variants? Are they kind of picking from a menu, this is best practices within the question that you're trying to solve and then making a tweak. I'm trying to understand kind of how does the platform, you know, get me as a non-data data scientist to the algorithm that I need. And when I see 63 million, it's a huge number. Clearly, everyone's kind of getting their own flavor at the end of the process. We're not really sharing, you know, kind of a, 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 a potpourri of kind of best practices. So how so, does that actually work? So one of our guiding principles is not just to find a good model to solve a problem. It's to provide the best model to solve a specific problem. So what we do is data is introduced to the platform. The, the platform then looks at all of the open source models written in R, Python, H2O, Spark ML Lib, and it determines what the best model is for that specific use case. Um, and that can be done with or without data science knowledge. Obviously coupled with a data scientist, they can tune and configure um, specific to the use case but it's really not required. So you're doing data science for data scientists, basically. You're providing a service to make them more efficient as one of the core value propositions. It's a productivity tool for them, but it's also opening it up to what you had mentioned around letting business analysts do data scientists because there is a shortage of those resources. So if they could do predictive analytics using the platform with the guardrails that we have built in so that they're not overfitting models, they're not making bad predictions, we protect them from doing that. So now we have a, a far broader audience 
that can do data science, we can now incorporate data science in any company. So you got a flywheel going on. Let me see if I get this right. So you've got to recruit the core data scientist guys who come in, and they have some serious chops. As you know, DevOps, they write some serious code. And then as they get the flywheel going, you build on that. So there's a community aspect of the code. And then as the flywheel gets going, that renders itself for kind of the general broader market. Is that right? That's correct. And, um, and again, if a company doesn't have a data scientist, it doesn't prevent them to, from doing predictive analytics. Uh, we have a lot of customers. We have customers that have 10 employees. We have customers in the Fortune 500. Um, but that doesn't prevent those smaller companies yeah. from doing it. This is exactly what Peter Burris was talking about when he now is heading up our research, where the community aspect is a critical part of the business model. Because if I don't have a data scientist, I can come into the store, if you will, the community. Right. And either engage a data scientist directly or use some of the product there. Is that, is that how it works? Is, can I take advantage of some of those, those best practices? Can I stand on their shoulders, if you will? So that's, uh, that's something that we offer also. So the, the product enforces best practices um, and the knowledge that our data scientists brought to the platform. But then we also have something called Data Robot University. And Data Robot University, of course, has product training. But it also has uh, the collective knowledge and best practices, um, the recipes that these data scientists that we have use to win and be number one in the world yeah. um, and apply that to real world business practice. So. Uh, we can provide a recipe for machine learning success uh, through our Data Robot University, not only teach um, our customers and prospects, but we teach our partners who are reselling. Uh, we're at the university level, so it can be used as a learning tool for students as they come out, and maybe they don't have real world knowledge um, on the product or on the data science, but they can use Data Robot to get them and to find the best model, to implement the best model, and not have to do that through a, a coding intense type of application development. So one of the things that, you know, first of all, you, got, you do guys are doing well. I just love the name. Bots are hot. You know, you've seen the chat bot thing happen with Microsoft. I don't know if you saw that. But, you know, bots are a way to automate, which is a real DevOps concept, which data science love. But you guys are doing some real hard-hitting uh, value for customers and verticals. And it seems to be, you know, that's where the action is. Can you talk about the use case specifically? We love sports. We have sports data, SV, an event we have here in Silicon Valley where you're seeing sports as a big market for using data. And Amazon reInvent, they always put the MLB example up there. You guys have a specific use case with a, a, a team using data robots. Can you share color around that? And uh, I can. So uh, data robot is vertical agnostic. Um, you know, when it breaks down to data science, it's a, a binary condition or a, you know, a, a regression analysis or a recommendation engine. They span all industries. But um, we do have a scenario where uh, the, uh, the, uh, the statistician from uh, the real live Moneyball, uh, they, uh, he, Peter DiPodesto worked for uh, the, or, I'm sorry, the, the New York Mets, and uh, they implemented and did their player selection using uh, Data Robot for two years. Uh, we were very proud that they made it to uh, the World Series. Um, we had uh, even Boston fans where we're headquarters were rooting for <laughs> uh, for a big win there. Uh, they came up, you know, uh, second place there, but we were still very proud that we were part of, uh, you know, their uh, getting to that stage. Well, can I hack the algorithm? Because I'm not a big Mets fan. Obviously, the Red Sox <laughs> fan. 86 was just a disappointment, the Buckner thing. Anyway, so have you done it for the Red Sox, too, or is it just the Mets? The Mets was, obviously doing great. It was just the Mets. Um, yeah. that so you're taking credit for all the Mets' success. Well, <laughs> we'll share in some of that. Chris, Chris, how do people get started? I mean, do you find most of your customers, you know, are already kind of in, in this space, and this is really an efficiency tool that they can do more, better, faster? Or do you see this as kind of training wheels for people that know they want to get in the space and they're not sure where to start? Or you mentioned a 10-person startup, they don't necessarily have the expertise. You know, from, from your experience with all your customers, how do people get started? What's the easiest path to success? Mm -hmm. If somebody's out there watching saying, how do I get started? You know, what, what would you tell them? So there's a number of different starting points. I think what we're seeing is that from an enterprise perspective, the larger customers are trying to get off older legacy technology that's not producing the most accurate models uh, that are very reliant on expensive infrastructure around you know, full SaaS platforms or IBM SPSS platforms. Uh, and they want to move off and leverage the newer technologies that are producing more accurate models, more scalable models, and implementing those very, very quickly. And that's where we're seeing a lot of starting points. And how are they measuring success beyond just straight up, you know, ROI, just uh, a hard number? What are some of the other kind of KPIs that people are using to say, wow, this is actually working well? So two things that are really important. One is 
the accuracy of the model. Um, and not only do we produce a leaderboard when we perform that competition against all the outstanding models, but that leaderboard is ranked based on accuracy. But it also gives you a matrix on performance. So if somebody has a real-time predictive analytics needs, they can find the fastest model with, or sorry, the most accurate model within the, the time frames that they have to uh, make predictions from. So we see, um, we, we offer that component as part of the product itself also. What are you guys doing to attract the kind of data scientists you do? Because you guys have a, an awesome model. I mean, Docker, by the way, had a similar flywheel kind of mm -hmm. in a different way, but the, the community aspect's key. But you got to get the community. It is the chicken and the egg, so I'm sure uh, the data, data, data robot folks are like, okay, how do you lure them in? Or, you know, I would say lure, and it's not a real community word, but <laughs> how do you attract the best talent? Is it just put the best tools out there? Did you guys have a plan? What's the... So I think the, um, the data scientists that we have and these top data scientists all like to work together. They like to leverage the strengths that the other data scientists have. Um, and the fact that they can all work collaboratively and to build a platform based on their knowledge. So when DataRobot is um, lacking in an area, they can collaborate and find a way to, again, produce the top model to produce the most efficient way to implement those models. So they enjoy working with each other um, and we've had, found great success in, in recruiting that way. What's the vision of Data Robots? Where do you guys see? Obviously, you've got some funding. NEA's involved. Love that big name. They do a lot of great deals. You guys have got plenty of funding. You're Boston-based. Mm -hmm. You're not in Silicon Valley. Um, what's the vision for the company? What's the next um, path for you guys? What's the next mountain you're going to climb? So we really want to, to make data science and predictive analytics available to all companies. And in doing that, um, it means that we have to have a very flexible, deployable platform. So you saw the 60 million models, that's for our cloud-based. As you can imagine, most companies today can't put data in the public cloud. So we support private cloud deployments, we support bare metal, Linux, and Hadoop, which is kind of our, uh, you know, our connection here to Strata. Uh, we have a deep integration with Cloudera, and we've, uh, we've deployed the product and integrated uh, specifically to Cloudera, specifically to Hortonworks and what they offer. Uh, some of the examples of that are we can deploy via Cloudera's parcels. So as a single object not connected to the Internet, we can deploy this to hundreds of nodes. Um, and, when, and we separate out the distribution with the activation. So you can deploy to the hundreds of nodes when ready to activate. Uh, you simply do that. It gives you 100% uptime. You can do rolling upgrades. We've also integrated to Cloudera's CSDs, which is their customer, custom service descriptor. So Data Robot looks within the, the Cloudera Manager platform just as any of their projects. So when you see HDFS, you, you'd be able to configure, manage, and monitor. HDFS, HBase, Impala, Sentry, Data Robot is another project within that. What about outside of Cloudera? Because one of the things that people want to do is integrate in. We hear a lot of things about completeness and integration mm -hmm. um, and operationalizing, and that's not necessarily a you know, clean sheet of paper. In some cases, if you have the luxury of booting it up from scratch, you can roll out a, a Impala or a Cloudera. But in most cases, someone might have an Oracle database or the databases might be older. Mm -hmm. How do you guys deal with that? Or is that something that you're with the data scientists deal with? No, so that's okay. So if somebody has a bare metal Linux platform running a database, we can ingest data from those different sources, whether it's um, a Hadoop type platform or not. Um, we also incorporate, you know, across the board, the, the things that enterprise customers require around security. So integrating with Kerberos, Active Directory, LDAP, and then, you know, uh, you know authorization using Grant Revoke with things like Sentry. Um, and then all of the projects that Hortonworks has also. So, you know, the Ambari integration, Ranger, Falcon, um, Atlas, you know, those we're also building in that integration. The benefit to Data Robot is we leverage all of that infrastructure. So if they're uh, sitting on an, you know, a fully encrypted platform that has all of the governance, compliance, and lineage capabilities, we leverage and sit right on top of that. What's your take of the, of the, of the show this week? Strata and Dube, obviously big data week, big data in Silicon Valley, SV as we call it, big data SV. What's your take on this year's, what's the vibe so far? I mean, the show's kicking off, but what's the, what's the smell in the air here? What's the vibe you're, you're seeing? We're seeing uh, quite a bit of interest in predictive analytics, of course. Um, that would be uh, very interesting to us. Um, and, you know, being able to deploy on the platforms typically around big data, uh, we're seeing 
great success there. I think that uh, what's also unique about the integration with that platform is the merging of technologies where you have in-memory models written in R and Python um, merging with the scale-out models that you see in H2O and MLlib. And what DataRobot does, it, it builds transparency around that. So we'll pick the best model based on a specific use case so that users don't have to worry about R coding, Python coding, Scala coding. Um, that, all of that is uh, encompassed into the platform itself. How many employees do you guys have? What's the growth plan for data robots? What's some of the tactical things you guys are doing? We're uh, seeing significant growth, and we have about 140 employees today. Uh, we were very fortunate in our early rounds of funding that um, our backers allowed us to fully develop the product and not be influenced externally by revenue and customers driving the product in a direction specific to their needs. So we built the platform and deployed it um, as a production-ready platform over a year ago. Now we're looking at the ability to scale on any platform, which is cloud, private cloud, uh, bare metal platforms, and Hadoop. So you're vertical agnostic on the application side, and you're platform agnostic on deployment. That's correct. So that gives us that, that goal of being able to deploy to any company. Um, we're also seeing, though, within certain verticals, um, specifically around finance, healthcare, um, insurance that have very high um, modeling and predictive needs, you know, certain areas where we can enhance the product to be very spe specifically vertical for them, and then also resellers and uh, value-added partners that are embedding data robot as their predictive engine. So they don't have to focus their time and energy on that component of the product. They focus on the vertical value that they're bringing to the platform itself. So I was going to say, and you, you said that you just closed a B round, which is not easy these days in, uh, in this funding environment. Somebody tweeted this morning that there's no tech IPOs, John, in Q1 of 2016. Um, and, and you've had a lot of conversations about difficulty with B rounds with, with some yeah. of our BC <laughs> community. So congratulations. You guys are obviously doing something right. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, appreciate you coming on the Cube and sharing your insight. And of course, we could use your uh, data robots for our Cube Madness promotion. <laughs> Uh, we have a Cube Madness at SiliconAngle.tv. It's a little takeoff on the NCAA where you vote for your favorite Cube alumni. And uh, we're at the final four, so get your votes and go to the Cube Madness. Check it out. This is the Cube. Congratulations on your success and have a great show. This is the Cube, extracting the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier with Jeff Frick. We'll be right back with more after this short break.